Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So uh, any questions from last week? All right. Then let's start. Can we have a volunteer to read from 52? All cognizant. I can start, Prabhuji. Please go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> Any person who can understand the feeling of all persons are incidents in all places at all times is called all cog uh, cognizant. A nice example of all of the all cognizant quality of the Lord is described in Srimad Bhagavatam, 1st Canto, 15th Chapter, verse 11. In connection with Durvasa Muni's visit to the house of the Pandavas in the forest, following the calculated plan, Duryodhana sent Durvasa Muni and his 10,000 disciples to be guests of the Pandavas in the forest. Duryodhana arranged for Durvasa and his men to reach the place of the Pandavas just when the Pandavas lunchtime ended so that the Pandavas would be caught without sufficient means of feed such a large number of guests. Knowing Darvasa's plan, Krishna came to the Pandavas and asked their wife, Draupati, if there was any remnants of food which she could offer to him. Draupati offered him a container in which there was only a little fragment of some vegetable preparation and Krishna at once ate it. At that moment, all of the sages accompanying Darvasa were taking bath in the river and when Krishna felt satisfaction from eating Draupati's offering, they also felt satisfaction and their hunger was gone because Darvasa and his men were unable to eat anything more. They went away without coming to the house of the Pandavas. In this way, the Pandavas were saved from the wrath of Durvasa, Duryodhana, Durvasa. Duryodhana had sent them because he knew that since the Pandavas would not be able to receive such a large number, Durvasa would become angry and the Pandavas would be cursed. But Krishna saved them from the calamity by his trick and by his all congent quality. Thank you, Prabhuji. Okay, so uh, I just want to draw your attention to the definition of all cognizant. It says here, any person who can understand the feelings of all persons and incidents in all places at all times is called all cognizant. In other words, Krishna as a uh, um, as Paramatma, sitting in the heart of everyone, knows what's, what they're thinking, what they're feeling. He knows it all. And also with his chit potency, he knows whatever is happening anywhere and everywhere. There's a verse in Bhagavad Gita which says, uh, I think 726, Veda aham samtitani vartamanani cha arjuna bhavishyani cha bhutani he says, I know the past, I know the present, and I know the future, and I know, I know every living entity. What they are up to, what they have been up to, and what they will be up to. So I know it all. And therefore, I also know what they're feeling. And one other thing is, whenever they do something for me, I know what their intent is. As we know, we judge other people by their actions. Because we have no way of knowing what their intention is. But Krishna does not judge us by our actions. Rather, he judges us by our intent. And that is how he makes a distinction between a demon like a Shishupal 
was constantly absorbed his thoughts. You know, here in the Kashipu, uh, Shishupala I just mentioned, uh, Kansa, Ravan, they were constantly absorbed in the thoughts of Krishna, which is Vishnu Smarnam, which is one of the nine processes of devotion service, but they are not known as devotees because their intent was not good. So similarly, when we perform any service for Krishna, Krishna is not looking at how much money we donated or how many hours we cooked or you know how many hours spent uh, cleaning the temple. He's not looking at that. He's looking at what's the feeling in our heart behind that service. And he values that. Rupad used to say, Krishna is not looking at the size of your check when you donate something. But he's looking at how much money you leave, uh, leave behind yourself. In other words, if you got $100 million and you give a check for 2000 it's just, yeah, okay, fine. But somebody who has only $5,000 in his pocket or his bank account, and he gives his check of $500, Krishna is very happy to say, oh, you give 10% of what total worth. There was a story about a little boy who came to Prabhupada and handed him about a dollar in change. And just before that boy had come, a man had given $1,000. The $1,000 was a lot of money in the 60s. Prabhupada took the chuk, uh, check and just put it aside. And when the boy came with less than a dollar in change in his hand, gave it to Prabhupada, Prabhupada was so happy he hugged him. And somebody asked him, and he said, that was probably everything this boy had in his, uh, you know, in Hindi they call it gullak, I don't know what the English word is. Um, anyway, what, whatever that piggy is. Bank. Piggy bank. Piggy bank. Yes, yes, piggy bank. I couldn't think of it. In his piggy bank, that's all he had. But this man is a millionaire, so he gives thousand dollars. What's the big deal? Anyway, the point is, so as being all cognizant, Krishna understands, you know, what our intention is, what our feeling is, how we are feeling, and that's how he knows that we should come to help. And in that regard, a very wonderful story <clears throat> has been presented by Rupa Goswami. It's missing some details, so unless everybody knows the story. I can tell the story. So please tell me if everybody knows the story already, then I will not bother going into the details. If not, then I'll say some details. So somebody like to speak up and say yes or no? Everybody knows. Prabhu. Yes, Prabhu. Yes, yes Prabhu. Prabhu. Everybody knows. Well, don't speak Which... for everybody. You say you know. <laughs> Which story? <laughs> this is a story about Prabhu. Dhruva Samuni. Oh, Dhruva Samuni, yeah. Okay, all right, then I will not bother uh, with the details. The point is that Duryodhan was playing a game uh, by sending, Duryodhan had come to his house for dinner or lunch, whatever it was, uh, and had been served very nicely and was very pleased with the service of Duryodhan. And then Duryodhan said, you know, you've been so kind to me, my dear Duryodhan, you should also be kind to my cousins. And he sent them, or he advised him, along with his 10,000 uh, disciples, to go to the hut where the Pandavas are living because they were in exile. Knowing that by the time he gets there, it will be after lunch. And that Draupadi had this pot given to him by, it's called Akshay Patra, given by Sun God. And that the, the condition was, once she finishes eating and washes the pot, she cannot cook anymore. Not until the next time for cooking. And but if she has not eaten or cleaned the pot, then she could produce um, food stuff for as many people as required. So as planned by Udriyodhan, there was someone who had shown up at that time. So immediately, Draupadi started calling for Krishna. And that's the point I want to make. Krishna sitting in Dwarka knew right away that my, my sister, my devotee, Draupadi, whom I call Krishna, is in trouble. He's calling me. He immediately showed up. And you know Krishna, he doesn't talk direct. He's parokshwadi, which means he speaks indirectly. So knowing the full situation, instead of saying, you know, let me help you, he says, Draupadi, I'm so hungry. You know, give me some food. And she looks at him and says, Krishna, I'm already in trouble. You know, there's 10,000 disciples of Dvasamuni. They've come, they're going to take their bath, and they're going to come back to eat, and I have nothing to give. And now you want as well? I said, yeah, I do. I'm hungry. And so she told the whole story to him, said, I got nothing left. 
I've already washed the pot. I ate it. I've eaten and I've washed the pot. And Krishna said, no, no, show me that pot anyway. And he found a little piece of sabji sal, whatever. Some people will say rice, it doesn't matter. And he ate it. And because he felt satisfied, the whole world got satisfied. So Durvasa Muni has 10,000 disciples were not only satisfied, they were actually belching. They were so full. And that time, um, there was someone who and said, there's no way we can eat anymore. But we have promised to come back and honor Prashadam. We go back there and tell them we're not going to eat and she has cooked for 10,000 people. They'll be very upset. And there was someone who remembered the incident with Ambarish Maharaj. What was the incident with Ambarish Maharaj? Anybody? Oh, yeah. huh? He came uh... With Ambrish Maharaj, he he had a katsi and he wanted to. Right. He drank little water and right. he was cursed. Right, exactly. So he had offended Ambrish Maharaj and he got into so much trouble for doing that. I mean, the Sudarshan Chakra had chased him for a whole one year. So remembering that, he said, I don't want to offend these devotees like Pandavas. They actually ran away from that place. And so by being all cognizant and therefore recognizing that his devotee, Draupadi, was in trouble and Pandavas were in trouble, Krishna showed up and helped them. That's the all cognizant quality of, of Krishna that's being described in this particular section. Now, we know uh, and the reason, I think I mentioned in short, that uh, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, uh, that I reside in the heart of everyone. Similarly, uh, in chapter 18, six, text 61, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, uh, Ishwasar Bhutanam Hiddeshe Arjun That again, as, as supreme controller, I reside in the heart of every living entity. And therefore, I know what they're thinking, what they're feeling, you know, they're suffering or they're enjoying, whatever. I know it all. Now, I mentioned also yes, last week, that qualities 51 through 55 are also present in Lord Shiva, but not in the normal living being, living entities. So none of us have these qualities, 51 through 55. But Lord Shiva and of course, Lord Krishna and Lord Narayan, they have those qualities. It's also known as Trikalagya, which means I know the present, I know the past, and I know the future, anywhere and everywhere. Okay. Any questions? Questions or comments? Okay, all right. Somebody did the next one. <clears throat> 53. I can read, Prabhupada. Please go ahead. Krishna, 53, ever fresh. Krishna is always remembered. And his name is always chanted by millions of devotees. But the devotees never become satiated. Saturated. Saturated. Instead of becoming in, disinterested in thinking of Krishna and in chanting his holy name, the devotees get, get newer and newer impetus to continue the pro progress process. Sorry. Therefore, Krishna is ever fresh. Not only Krishna himself, but also Krishna's knowledge is ever fresh. Bhagavad Gita, which was imparted 5,000 years ago, is still being read repeatedly by many, many men and is still new light is always being found in it. Therefore, Krishna and his name, fame, qualities, and everything is thing in relationship with him is ever fresh. All the queens of Dwarka were goddess goddess of fortunes it is said in shrimad bhagavatam first point to 11th chapter verse 33 that the goddess of fortunes are very fickle and restless so no one can constitute no one can consistently captivate them thus one's luck will always change sometime yet the goddess of fortune could 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 not leave krishna for even a moment when they were residing with him at Dwarka. This means that Krishna's attraction is ever fresh. Even the goddess of fortune cannot leave him, leave his company. 
Regarding Krishna's attractive features being ever fresh, there is a statement by Radharani in the Lalita Madhav, in which Krishna is compared to the greatest sculpture, sculpture because he is expert in wrestling um, at the chastity, chastity of women. In another word, in other words, although ch chaste women may follow the rules and regulation of Vedic principles to become ever faithful to their husband, Krishna is able to break their stone-like chastity with the uh, with the ch chisel of his beauty. Most of the girlfriends of Krishna were married, but because Krishna was their friend, because their marriages before their marriages, they could not forget his attractive features, which were always fascinated to them, even after their marriages. Yeah, thank you. So let me ask you, what does the word fresh mean to you? Anybody? Always fresh. What does fresh mean? How to say? <laughs> <laughs> That's not the answer I'm looking for. Hare Krishna Anybody? Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Does it mean very new, always remaining new? Yeah, that's one meaning. Yes. Anything else? Always in fashion, Prabhu. It doesn't go out of... Uh... Ah, spoken like a woman. Yeah, sure. <laughs> always in fashion. Right? It yes, doesn't okay. go out of... Uh, agreed. Taste. Yeah. Totally agreed. What else does it mean? It's when never you... forgettable, you can say. Not we forgettable? Always... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Prabhu, also one who's not... Tired. You know how we get at the end of the day tired, but he's... Oh, he okay. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What does it Old. Nitya what? Something that never gets old. Never gets old. Yes. Absolutely. What else? Old or stale, let's say. Stale. Like yeah. think Sabji. Right? Or the jokes. You hear the same joke 10 times, it gets stale. And that's why the wives complain. Oh, my husband always tells the same story, same joke. I'm so bored. But he's telling other people, but she's the common person. What can you do? What else? You never go out of syllabus, Prabhuji, like Bhagavad Gita. Ah. Beautiful example here, right? Yes, Whenever absolutely. you read it, for what, like first given to Sun God, it was new. Given to Arjun, it was new. We have read it. It was new. We will read it. It will always be new. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely right. What else does it mean? <laughs> like Prabhuji, like like Gopi say in Gopi Geet when Krishna comes in the evening, he has all that dust on his face and he still looks beautiful. He looks fresh. But yes. if when we come back from office in the evening, everybody <laughs> knows. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes even before we come back from the office. Yes. Yes. Nandakumar Prabhu, you were saying something. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Uh, so uh, fresh also can be like every time it gives a different perspective. Hari bol, yes, absolutely right, absolutely right. So okay, great. So I'm glad I asked you this question because all those things apply to Krishna, and I gave some very obvious examples. Uh, how many times have you read Bhagavad Gita? But every time you pick it up, you read a paragraph or a verse, there's something new. Even though you read the same paragraph, same verse, maybe. 20 times, 30 times. But every time you pick it up, there's something new coming up. Yep. Similarly, we chant Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Now, try singing uh, a Bollywood song. You know, dum dum diga diga, mausam bhiga bhiga. Do it, do it 10 times, 20 times. After that, you don't want to sing anymore. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> you, you watch a Bollywood movie, Hollywood movie. Two times, three times after that, no, you don't see it anymore. But Krishna Katha, you can hear a million times. Any video about Krishna, you can watch as many times as you want. Any class, you can hear about Krishna as many times as you want. Something yeah. new every time. So it doesn't get stale. It doesn't get outdated. Never gets out of syllabus. You know, no matter what situation you are in, no matter what age you are at, no matter what social status you are at, no matter what your gender is, no matter what country you live in, it's a message for you in Bhagavad Gita. It transcends space and time. Right? Nana was saying, you spoken first time two million years ago. 
Then again, 5,000 years ago. But the message is still fresh and it's still just as applicable. So it never goes out of syllabus. You are always finding ourselves in a situation for which there's an answer in Bhagavad Gita. Right? So it's not just Krishna himself, it's Krishna's name, his qualities, his fame, his paraphernalia, none of that. His messages, his knowledge, none of that ever goes stale. It's always fresh. Okay? Ever fresh. Ever fresh. Yes, that's right. Great. Um, now, let me just see if there's anything else. Um, yeah. How many times we hear that husband and wives, not wives, husband and wife, they barely speak to each other. It's not that because they didn't fight. It's just that they're bored of each other. The same <laughs> conversation, same habit, same good habit, same bad habit, same reactions, and wives cooking the same thing. People get bored. But not with Krishna. He's giving the example of, of uh, the queens of Dwarka. You know, they were never bored. You know, and then the example is being made here is that they were all actually Lakshmis, goddesses of fortune. Now, what's the one quality of Lakshmi? Anybody wants to guess? What's one very famous quality of Chanchala. Lakshmi? Chanchala. Chanchala, there you go. Actually, Chala means Lakshmi. Chanchala means something, something that's fickle, something that doesn't stay in one place a long time, somebody that's constantly moving. And that's the quality of Lakshmi. It never stays in one place all the time. But these women these queens of Dwarka, they were constantly with him. Hearing his jokes, playing with him, discussing with him, <clears throat> excuse me, serving him, all those things. And he used to go to uh, Hastinapur a lot and they would miss him like anything. The whole description of Lord Krishna coming back from Hastinapur to Dwarka and how they come out of the palaces to receive their husband. Like it's unbelievable how much they missed him when he was not there and how much they never got tired. His stories, his company, his jokes, his performances, everything. Because Krishna is ever fresh, never gets stale. Um, let's see what else he says. Um, oh yeah, his his um, his beauty, his attractive feature, always fresh, and um, and this is this reference of Lalit Madhav. A book that I believe is written by Rupa Goswami, maybe Saranath Goswami, I'm not 100% sure. But it talks about the pastimes between Radha and Krishna. And so that's, there's a reference of that, how Krishna stole the heart of even the uh, even the uh, married girls. Um, it's known as Parakiya Bhav. Everybody knows the difference between Swakiya Bhav and Parakiya Bhav? Yeah, Parakya Bhav is with the, your husband and uh, uh, and the other one is with the... Uh, not your husband. Group. Uh, not, yeah. <laughs> okay, actually it's the other way around. Parakya Bhav means somebody who's not, you're not married to. Swakya means someone you're married to. But anyway, the point is that in in Vrindavan, most of the time, past times, were considered parakiya bhav. And the reason is that parakiya bhav, when, we are, when a man is with women who are not married to him, uh, there's more uh, excitement. And But before, I know you people on the call will not, but before anybody thinks that's perverted, yes, in the age of Kali, by done by anybody other than Krishna, it is perverted contemptible, not allowed, not legal and all those kind of things. Not moral, not ethical, certainly not Krishna conscious. But Krishna is doing that because let's understand, everyone belongs to Krishna. Everyone's husband is Krishna. We are all Prakriti and we all belong to Krishna. He's our master. Sure. So that's one thing. The second thing is that you remember the uh, Brahma Vibhuhan Leela? What did Krishna do in that Leela? Anybody knows? In Brahma He commanded himself into all gopas and calves. Correct. 
And in one scripture, uh, one Acharya says that it was during that year when Krishna had expanded with all the Gop Gopa boys, these girls got married. So they actually got married to Krishna. And therefore, there's no question of Parakiya Bha. So not only they all belong to Krishna anyway, even their marriage was to Krishna, the expansion of Krishna as one of those Gopas. So there's no pervertedness, there's nothing immoral, there's nothing wrong with, with that. But the point is, in the past time, the, these women came to Krishna because it's so attractive that they didn't care about their own reputation. They didn't care about what the family or the society would say. They didn't care about what would happen to them when they tried to come back because of the attraction to Krishna. So that's the other quality of you know, ever, ever fresh. Any questions or comments? Yes, Prabhu. Uh -huh. Prabhu, uh, you just mentioned that all the gopis got married to Krishna because he expanded to all those gopas, right? So Abhimanyu was also Krishna. Oh, it's totally Krishna. His shadow. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean to say he, Krishna expanded even Abhimanyus, in Abhimanyus. So, so it doesn't go specific, the, the paragraph that I read, specifically say yes or no, but it says all the Gopas were expansions of Krishna. Even, but but for Abhimanyu, even especially it said that he is a shadow of Krishna anyway. So even if it's not the expansion, and I don't know that, but he's considered shadow of Krishna, which means Krishna. Look at it this way. Nobody else can come near Adharani. It has to be Krishna. There was, there's no way. Nobody, I mean, they'll burn. If they got within two feet of Radharani, they'll burn. Burn into ashes. So it had to be Krishna. Right? Any other questions or comments? How do we say this in English? Like forever young, fresh? Oh, sorry. Oh, look at me. How do we say it in Hindi? <laughs> Taze, taze. No, taze. It's like a word. Nitya, nam, nitya, something. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry, Dev Jani? Uh, Chori, Kishore. Nitya, Kishore, Kishore? No, no, no. no. Not no. Kishore. That, that is for like a particular age. Yes. Navi Yovanam, Prabhuji. Huh? Navi Yovanam. Oh, I don't think that's what she meant, though. Navi Yovanam basically means how much young hai. Yeah. Fresh, yes, right. How do we say this in Hindi, Prabhuji? Like, Krishna is forever fresh. Like, nav, nitya, nav, something. Nav, nav. You can say prafulit. Like, no, no, prafulit means happy. What? Prafulit means happy. He is nav, yona. Okay, I guess we don't know then the answer to your question. Search on Google. <laughs> <laughs> Hindi wala. We're, we're oh, English Hindi scholars, wala. everybody. Hindi <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Fresh. Huh? Such, a, such a common word. I, I, like, I know that in Urdu is Taza. Huh? Taza. In Urdu is called Taza. In the Hindi book it says Nitya Naveen. Nitya Naveen, okay. Maybe that's possible. Yeah. So this is what it said in the Hindi. Okay. Uh, okay. Hindi book. Nectar of Hindi Naveen, book. we can say. Okay, I mean, I can accept that. Nit Naveen is naya naya. Nit Naveen is naya naya. So that, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. I don't know, Nana satisfied, but it makes sense. <laughs> okay. Any other question? Any other easy question? Prabhuji, <laughs> in the Hindi medium, uh... Uh, trans in the Hindi media no, medium book of this one ah. will show what his exact word is. Kya hai? Kya hai? Hindi version. Aapas hai? The book. Aapas. Hindi version of this book. I know I'm asking you. Aapas hai wo. I, I don't have that. Okay, that's what I ask. Actually, I do have it. If I go right. to the room, I can find it. There is what I read from Nitya Naveen it says. Oh, they, okay, then there you go. That's it. Authentic. Yeah. Nitya Naveen. So, thappa lagi. There is there Nitya Naveen. Thank you. That's great. So, to bhaisu kujai si nahi hai. Maybe. It is a dumb. Hum log geometry padte the, usme aakhir mein theorem ki aakhir mein kya thi? It is a dumb. 
सिद्ध हो गया सिद्ध हो गया ओके एनी अदर क्वेश्चन और कॉमेंट्स और राइट लेट्स गो टू द नेक्स्ट वन हु वुड लाइक टू वॉलंटियर आई कैन आई कैन से इट प्रभु प्लीज गो हैड यस सच्चिदानंद विग्रह Krishna's transcendental body is eternal, full of knowledge and bliss. Sat means ever existing for all time and in all places. In other words, all pervading in time and space. Chit means full of knowledge. Krishna has nothing to learn from anyone. He is independently full of all knowledge. Ananda means reservoir of all pleasure. The impersonalists are seeking to merge into Brahman effulgence of eternity and knowledge. But the major portion of the absolute pleasure. which is in krishna is avoided by them one can enjoy the transcendental blissfulness of merging into brahman effulgence after being freed from the contamination of material illusion false identification <laughs> attachment detachment and material absorption these are the preliminary qualifications of a person who can realize brahman it is stated in bhagavad gita that one has to become full of joyfulness <clears throat> this is not exactly joyfulness but a sense of freedom from all anxieties freedom from all anxieties may be the first principle of joyfulness but it is but it is not actual joyfulness those who realize the self or become brahma bhuta are only preparing themselves for the platform of joyfulness that joyfulness can actually be achieved only when one comes into contact with krishna krishna consciousness is so complete that it includes the transcendental pleasure derived from impersonal or brahman realization even the impersonalist will become attracted to the personal form of krishna known as shama sundara it is confirmed by the statement of brahma samhita that the brahman effulgence is a bodily ray of krishna the brahman effulgence is simply an exhibition of the energy of krishna krishna is the source of brahman effulgence as he himself confirms in bhagavad gita from this we can conclude that the impersonal feature of the absolute truth is not the ultimate end krishna is the ultimate end of the uh, absolute truth the members of vaishnava schools therefore never try to merge into brahman effulgence in their pursuit of spiritual perfection they accept krishna as the ultimate goal of self realization therefore krishna is called para brahman the supreme brahman or parameshwara the supreme controller sri yamunacharya has prayed as follows My dear Lord, I know that the gigantic universe and gigantic space and time within the universe are covered by the ten layers of the material elements. Each layer is ten times larger than the previous one. The material modes of nature, the Garbhodaka, the Garbhodaka Shai Vishnu, the Shirodaka Shai Vishnu, the Maha Vishnu, and beyond them the spiritual sky. and its spiritual planets known as vaikuntas and the brahman effulgence in that spiritual sky all these are taken together are nothing but a small exhibition of of your potency hari bo hari bo this is heavy thank you gautam no problem so my pleasure bro wow okay are you set to understand this one ah uh, this is going to be fun okay let's get started yeah. Where in Bhagavad uh, Brahma Samhita do we hear the term Sachidanand Vigraha? Anybody? Ishwar Param Krishna Sachidanand Vigraha. Right there. Adi Anandi. Adir Govinda Sarukaran Karanam. Hari Bol. Yes. So Brahma Samhita Lord Brahma is describing who Lord Krishna is. Yes. Krishna is. Ishwara Parma means supreme controller. Ishwar means controller. Ishwara Parma or Parma Ishwara, whatever, is supreme controller. Who is that? Krishna. But what's so special about Krishna? Brahma, Lord Brahma says, Satchidanand Vigra. His Vigra, his form is Sat, means eternal. Chit means full of knowledge. Anand means full of bliss. eternal means there never was a time it didn't exist natve vaham jatu nasam natam neme janadhipa right um, bhagavad gita 
chapter 2, text 12, right? Krishna says to Arjun, there never was a time you didn't exist, I didn't exist, or all these kings did not exist, right? Similarly, is everyone familiar with the Chatur Shloki in Shivad Bhagavatam? What is Chatur Shloki in Shivad Bhagavatam? It's chapter 10. Eight, nine, huh? eight, nine, ten, eleven. What are you talking about? Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita. Your answer is correct, but that's Bhagavad Gita. Shivad Bhagavatam. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Ha, Shalin Mataji. Uh, Prabhu, I don't know the exact context, but I think it is Canto 2, chapter 10, point 36, 37, 38, 39. Actually, very close. It's Canto 2 for sure. It's chapter 9. Text 33, 34, 35, 36. And let me, let me um, chant the first one because that's the only one I remember. I don't remember the other three. I can Google it and read it to you if you want, but let's just go with 33. It says, Aham eva sam eva gre na anyat yat sat asat param paschat aham yad etacha yo vivasayata sosmi ham it says here, uh, this is Lord Vishnu is speaking to, actually Gavadashai Vishnu is speaking to Lord Brahma. He's saying, before anything else existed, I was there. Aham eva, means me only, asam eva Before anything existed, I existed. And nothing else, sat or asat, nothing existed at that time. And after the annihilation, after this material world, what's left is me. There's nothing else left. In other words, I'm the beginning, the yeah. maintainer, I'm in the middle, and at the end, I'm the only one left. So basically he's saying, I'm eternal. I am eternal. Then somebody may say, well, wait a minute. So, okay, so what's so special about that? Because all the living entities are eternal, right? We are Satchidananda also, correct? Anybody disagree with that? Are we or are we not Satchidanan? Yes. Yes, we are. We are. So, as our body Satchidanan? Is our body Satchidanan? No. 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 We, as Asat as can get. As Asat as, as can get the body. Similarly, as Achit as it can get. And as Binanand as it can get. Right? But Krishna's body is also Satchidanan. That's the difference. There's another difference. You must have heard from Kathopanishad. Kathopanishad, it says, Nityo Nityanam Chetanas Chetanam Eko Bahunam Yo Vididhati Kama. Right? So he's saying that among all the eternal entities, Nityanam, he's the eternal one. Among all the Chetanas, Chetananam, which means all the entities that are cognizant, he's most cognizant. But above all, he is the one who provides for the satisfaction of the desires of all the other Chetananams or Nityanams. In other words, actually I was reading the purport um, of this verse. The purport says there's two types of eyes. The capital letter I, not E-Y-E-S. Capital letter I. It says Brahma is I and Krishna is I. Again, capital letter I. But the difference between Brahma and Krishna is Krishna is the predominator I, Brahma is the predominated I. In other words, Brahma, the predominated I, is doing whatever the predominator I is telling him to do. So that's the difference again. So he's eternal, but he's eternal differently from all the other eternal entities, which is a living entity. I'm going to pause. Did that make sense? If not, ask me a question. Kind of important concept. Hare Krishna Prabhu is Hare pretty Krishna. here. Can you can you repeat again? You said Krishna uh Brahma Lord Brahma is eternal as well. Yes, I can. So uh, the point that Prabhu was making was that Brahma, all the living entities, and Krishna, they're all eternal. But what's the difference? The difference is that we are all predominated. You understand the word predominated? Oh, yes, yes. Now I get it. I and get Krishna it. is the predominator. And we are the 
they're both eternal. And then in the purport, before it's giving the example of Brahma, who's also, you know, can say, well, I did this, I created. Brahma can say, I created, it's correct. But he created upon the orders and instruction and the instruction manual that he received from Krishna. But Brahma had no idea how to create. So Lord Krishna got on his flute, vibrated the sound, told him all the instructions. As a result, Brahma was able to create. How many types of bodies did he create? 8.4 million species. Probably. That's right. Exactly. He created 8.4 million different types of bodies. Japan being receiving instruction from the from Lord Krishna. So therefore, he's predominated. He's working on the dominion of Krishna. Krishna's predominator. He works under nobody's dominion. He's called Swarat. Uh, those of you who read Shri Bhagavatam, first canto, first chapter, first verse, then Madhya Seta, it says, Abhigya Swarat. Abhigya means full of knowledge. Swarat means independent. So not only he is knowledgeable, Krishna is knowledgeable or most knowledgeable, Krishna doesn't depend upon anybody for his knowledge. Everybody else gets knowledge from Krishna. But Krishna is not dependent upon anyone for whatever knowledge he has. And he knows it all. So when in his past time he goes to Sandeepani Muni, that's just a past time. He doesn't need to go. That's why he read, he understood uh, 64 different kalas in 64 days. It takes people lifetimes to learn one kala. But 64 days, because he already knew this. He's just doing the past time. Okay? So anyway, the point is Krishna is eternal. Next point is Krishna is Chit. Not Chadokhana Chit. Chit means he's <laughs> full of knowledge. Okay? Although he can be Chadokhana Chit if he's dealing with the devotees, pure devotees, but that's a different point. He's full of knowledge. But as I was saying, he's Abhigya, therefore, it's not that he has to learn something from somebody. Whatever he knows, he didn't have a guru. He just knows it. He knows everything. He's independently full of knowledge. As I was saying earlier, uh, chapter 7, Bhagavad Gita, text 26. Vedaham samtitani, vartamanani cha arjuna, bhavishyani cha bhutani, uh, mam tu vedna kashchana. So I know everybody. I know past, present, and future, but nobody knows me. Okay. So that's chit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, by the way, there's also something called chit potency, which is the potency by which Krishna knows himself. And we know Krishna. So remember, we were saying we were Satchidaran. So that portion of chit that we have, it allows us to know Krishna. Okay. Third point is Anand. Anand means what? Bliss. Bliss. Yeah, yeah. Reservoir of bliss or reservoir of all pleasure. This is why another name of Krishna is Ram. What does the word Ram mean? Bhagavan. Huh? Pleasure person. Reservoir of pleasure. I'm sorry, too many people spoke at the same time. What does it mean? Pleasure personified. Prabhupada. Pleasure personified, yes, absolutely. A reservoir of pleasure, pleasure personified. And so Radhika Ramana means the one who enjoys with Shivati oh. Radhalani. Ramana Yasi Iti Rama. The one who enjoys is Ram. Yes. So this happens to be another name name of the incarnation of Krishna, but the word Ram actually means reservoir of pleasure. Krishna is Ram. This is why Prabhupada said, when you say Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. Another meaning of word Ram is Krishna. So same Hare Krishna is being repeated in the second line. Except this time it's referring to his pleasure potency. Sorry, his, his quali quality of being reservoir of pleasure. All pleasure. And this is why devotional service is susukam kartum abhyam. As per chapter 9, text 2, Bhagavad Gita says, Bhakti is susukam, very pleasurable, because Krishna is very pleasurable. Okay. So, <clears throat> then, I'm sorry, but there's, a diff there's different levels and different types of bliss. So now, Rupa Goswami is 
getting into that. So now he starts talking about the impersonalists. He says, impersonalists are seeking to merge. I'm just reading from the book. Are seeking to merge into the Brahman effulgence. What's the quality of, in the context of Satchidanan, what is the quality of Brahman effulgence? In the context of Satchitanana. So, Brahman is Sat, which is eternal. Krishna uh, is eternal, therefore, his body is effulgence eternal and is full of knowledge. So, the two qualities of Brahman is Sat and Chit eternal and knowledge. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so let's see then what says next line. Then it says here, um, but the major portion of the absolute pleasure which is in Krishna is avoided by those who merge in the Brahman effulgence. That's the impersonalist. In other words, there's very little amount of um, pleasure there. That pleasure is known as Brahmasuk or Brahmasuk, which is infinitesimal compared to the bliss that we get from serving Krishna's lotus feet. So therefore, the impersonalists who merge in the Brahman effulgence don't feel much pleasure because there's no service. Because there's no Krishna there. It's just his effulgence. So is that point clear? Yeah. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Oh, Hare Krishna. Krishna. Yes, Mataji. Yes. Uh, Prabhu, who are these impersonalists? I mean, what do they do? What do they pray for? Sure, that's a very good question, Mataji. So impersonalists are those people who do not believe that Krishna has a form. So it's a nirakar. And they call it nirakar. There's no form. And therefore, it's like light. It's like air. Like how do you love light? How do you serve light? How do you offer bhog to light? You can't. So there's no relationship. So there's no relationship. There's no person. There's no form. Therefore, impersonal. It's like sometimes in our everyday language we say this is he's so impersonal because he doesn't like anybody, he doesn't like to have any relationship with anybody, he's aloof, I just does mechanically things. He's impersonal. Right? So same idea. So Prabhu, do they so do they think that Krishna are they at least thinking about Krishna that he doesn't have any form or they just they think actually there's no Krishna, okay. there's absolute truth, and the only feature that it has is it's light. No okay. form. Okay. okay. I, I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, but the immediate answer to your question is that. Anybody else? Okay. Prabhuji, we on, we, we, when we say impersonal, can we put the other ways of, you know, like Islam, Christianity, can we put them all under the impersonal Absolutely. umbrella? Absolutely. None okay. of them have uh, a form that they worship. As a matter of fact, both Christians and Islam people, they are against deity worship. Mm -hmm. they, they, in, in Urdu, they call it but parasti. But parasti. Right? Which means you're serving a, 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 a deity. And they say, no, that's not, actually in their, in their religion, it's an offense. Okay. All right, so let's keep, keep going. I'm just reading from the book again. Uh, are you all with me where I'm reading from? I'm about five lines down from the heading Satchidananda Vigraha. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Huh? So, uh, Sikh also comes in the impersonalist form as well? Impersonalisms? Sorry, say again? Sikh, Sikh, come, Sikh. Sikh, Sikh is them. So they, Sikhism, they, they, Sikhism. Huh? Sikh, Sikhism also comes into the personal. They yeah, so Sikhism, personal. they basically worship the book and Guru. Okay. They don't have form of a god that they worship. The The funny thing is that in the book, it talks about Govinda and and uh, some of the names yes. of Krishna. Ram. Ram, Ram. Ram yeah. They said Ram. But they, they don't talk about all that. So the Guru was very much personalist. But the disciples, for whatever reason, decided to become impersonalist. But quite a few Sikhs are coming to our temple as a problem. No, that's a different point. That's a different point. 
ओके उषा जी यस प्रभु ओके गुड थैंक यू एनी अदर क्वेश्चन All right, so let's keep going. So it says here the impersonalists are seeking to merge into Brahman effulgence of eternity and knowledge. We talked about that, but the major portion of the absolute pleasure, which is in Krishna, is about because there's no Krishna in Brahman effulgence. It's yes. that light. There's no service. There's no interaction. There's no pastime. There's no lila. There's there's nothing. No games being played. It's not standing there with. Big smile on his face. It's totally absent. So that pleasure portion of Sat Chit Anand is missing in Brahman Ekhojas. So that's why we were saying only Sat, the eternity, and Chit, the knowledge feature, are present in Brahman Ekhojas. And very, very, very minute amount of pleasure, which I'm going to describe what that means, is present there. Okay. <clears throat> so the next sentence says, One can enjoy the transcendental. Are you all with me on that? You can see that line. Yep. Okay. One can enjoy the transcendental blissfulness of merging into the Brahman effulgence after being freed from the contamination of material illusion, false identification, attachment, detachment, and material absorption. And material absorption. So basically, what it is saying is that. The pleasure that they feel after merging in the Brahman effulgence is not pleasure, but it's absence of the contamination of illusion, um, false ego, which is like I'm this body, uh, not spirit soul, or material attachment, or material detachment, or absorption in material things, material desires. So, because all these things call, cause anxiety and distress. The absence of that anxiety and distress, for them, that's the definition of pleasure. In other words, to them, happiness is absence of unhappiness. Are you all with me? Okay. So, again, the point that's not the same as the pleasure we get from receiving from serving Krishna. So, we continue. But this point is clear that absence of unhappiness is the definition of happiness. For the impersonalists, okay, they do realize Brahman. And there's a verse in Bhagavad Gita, fourteen twenty six. Mam cha yo avya bicharen bhakti yoga na sevate sa gunan samtit etan Brahma bhuyaay kalpate. This basically says on the Brahma Bhuta platform. Um, One can reach um, by getting above the modes of material nature. So, a person on the Brahma Bhuta platform has transcended the modes of material nature. Then, in 1854, what does it say? Um, Brahma Bhuta Prasannatma na Shochati na Kangshati Sama Sarvesh Bhuteshu Mad Bhaktim Labde Para. Rupad explains that. A person who has reached the Brahma Bhuta platform has no lamentation and no material desires. So you have now reached above the modes of material nature, and you have no material desires and you have no lamentation, and that you call happiness. Rupa says that's nothing. That's just the beginning of devotional service. Pleasure comes later. So these people have no devotion. Therefore, they have no real uh, happiness, but they don't know what real happiness is. So they think it's joyful, but Prabhupada is saying, "No, no, no, that's not joyfulness. Let me tell you what joyfulness is." Okay, so freedom from all anxieties may be the beginning of first principle of joyfulness, but it's not real joyfulness. It's not actual joyfulness. Okay. Um, And as I was quoting, eighteen fifty-four, those who reach the Brahma Bhuta platform are now just beginning to get to the platform of devotional service, where they will see or feel real joy. So I'm going to slow down and stop here. Are you with me so far? Is it making sense? Yes, Prabhuji. Okay, good. So then it says that joyfulness, the real, actual joyfulness, 
can be actually achieved only when one comes into contact with Krishna. And because for these people, there's no contact with Krishna, the real joy is not there. They're just calling absence of misery as joy. And that's not it. But those who come to that platform can decide if they choose to um, serve Krishna. And then that's the beginning of the platform. Now, it says Krishna consciousness is so complete that it includes the transcendental pleasure derived from Brahman realization. Which means that whatever pleasure these people are getting, the impersonalists after merging, that's already there in Krishna Bhakti. If you have a relationship with Krishna, you already have that. But that's just the beginning. That's insignificant to the real compared to the real thing. And therefore, there's another verse that's uh, being referred to indirectly here. Even the impersonalist will become attracted to the personal form of Krishna known as Shamsundar. So now, impersonalist, they have another name for them. It's called Atmaram. Anybody knows what Atmaram is? One who is satisfied in himself. Yes, exactly. Thank you. One who's satisfied in himself. Like, I don't need anything. I'm not hankering for anything. I'm not desiring anything. Whatever I have, I'm very happy. That's the Atmara. So there's a verse in Bhagavad, sorry, Shiva Bhagavatam, first canto. Um, uh, I think first canto, first chapter, text 10. It says, Atmara Muniyo Nirgantho Api Urukrame. Which means that even these Atmarams who don't hanker for anything, who don't want anything, who don't lament for anything, even and and those who are Munis, which is again sages who are simply uh, contemplating on different problems, different things, and they have no no material complications, no material desires, nothing. Even they perform Hatuki Bhakti of Krishna. Hatuki Bhakti means causeless devotion service of Krishna. Why? Because they get so attracted by the qualities of Krishna. Itam Bhuta Gunayari. The qualities of Krishna are so great that even these people become attracted to them. And the example is given of Lakshmi. Is anybody more chaste than Mother Lakshmi? She's very happy serving the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu or Lord Narayan. And what did she do at Ras Lila time? What did she do? Anyone? Absolutely. Hmm? She wanted to participate but then not allowed. Right. But she wanted to participate for what reason? What was the reason for participating? Not because you want to dance. She can dance. To give own. the to give the pleasure to Krishna for Krishna okay. pleasure. Exactly. She wanted association of Krishna so she could give him pleasure. But she's married to Vishnu. She's married to Narayan. But the point is, Krishna is so attractive that even she becomes attracted to Krishna. That's how attractive Krishna is. And then. He switches the point a little bit back again. He says, let's, talk, let's just talk about what is Brahman effulgence. Anybody knows what is Brahman effulgence? Krishna's, uh, Krishna's face is uh, bodily rays of Krishna. No, no, mother, let, let Nandamati Mata speak. Nandamati Mata, please go ahead. Krishna's face is uh, light comes. The light, yes, yes, exactly. The light that comes from the body and the face of Krishna is Brahmani mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the same thing, Prabhuji, like the okay. God is coming okay. from Brahmani. Yes, exactly. So it's the, it's the bodily rays, it's the effulgence of Krishna's body, is Brahmani Yes. Right? Where is the reference of Brahmani Fulgas in Brahmani Sangita? Anybody knows? It says yes, the statement Brahmani Sangita. What's the reference? Anybody knows? So it's text 40. 
यस्य प्रभाव प्रभवतो जगद अन्न कोटि कोटिषु अशेष वसुधा विभूत भिन्न तद ब्रह्म निष्कलम अनंत अशेष भूतम गोविंद आदि पुरुषम भगवदगीता Was that Bhagavad Gita chapter seven, text eight? The so ham apsu kaunteya prabhaso sashishuriya. It's I'm the light of the moon and the sun. That's the Brahmani fulgas because sun is reflecting light of Brahmani fulgas, and that's what's so bright. And the moon is reflecting the light of what? So sun is reflecting the light of Brahmani fulgas, and moon is reflecting light from sun. I'm sorry. Reflecting light from sun. Sun, yes, exactly. Moon is reflecting light of sun. So, Brahman effulgence, sun, moon. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> then he says, from this we can conclude that the impersonal feature of the absolute truth is not the ultimate end. And that somebody had asked the question, so now is the answer here. From this we can conclude that the impersonal feature of the absolute truth is not the ultimate end. Krishna is the ultimate end of the ultimate truth, of the absolute truth, and it's actually mentioned in Shrimad Bhagavatam, first canto, chapter two, text eleven, which says, "Vadanti tat tattva vidas tattam yad gyanam advayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavan iti shabdite," which says that the absolute truth comes in three features. It is said by those who know, and what is that? First feature is Brahmani Fulgas. Second feature is Paramatma. Third feature is Bhagavan, which is Krishna Himself, the personal mm. feature. So, absolute truth comes in three features. So, the impersonalist, impersonalist, stop at the first level, mm. which is the Brahmani Fulgas, and they say that's it. We don't need to go to that. Then, who are the people who go one step beyond to Paramatma feature? What's the term for that? Yogis. Yogis, exactly. Yogis are meditating on the Paramatma feature, and then the devotees or the Vaishnavas are meditating upon the Bhagwan, the personal feature of the Absolute Truth. So nobody is wrong, but impersonal understanding is incomplete. Yogis understand incomplete. Only devotees understand complete in that. When we talk about Bhagwan, it includes the Brahman effulgence, the impersonal feature, and it includes Paramatma, the Paramatma feature, and of course Krishna. Is that making sense? They know oh, the whole. I have a question. Sorry, let let Nand Pradeep Mataji finish. What is that? They they know the whole. Uh, they know the whole thing. thing. Exactly right. Yeah. They know all three features. I'm sorry, Priti. Go ahead, please. So, Prabhu, I was just I was just thinking. So. um other religions you said that um uh like christianity or muslim and and so on they don't uh they don't worship the real like they do they don't do devotional service that we do like we do they don't believe in krishna in 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 uh doing so the personal idols. feature of god yes so okay. um i was just wondering so it's only vaishnavas that attain the abode of lord krishna Yeah, or do yeah. they as well? Well, so it's possible that those who achieve the perfection at some in some birth they meet devotees and they become attracted to Krishna. Remember, I was reading that verse: "Atma Ramas Chamaniyo Nirgan Thoru Pramay." You want to have to give bhakti? It tham bhuta guna hari. The qualities of Krishna are so strong, so great that even these people who have achieved perfection in the impersonal way, they become attracted to. To the qualities of Krishna, the personal qualities of Krishna. So yes, if they become devotee of Krishna, then they can go go. Otherwise, they stop at the money fulfils. Even and like people like Mother Teresa, Prabhu. <laughs> well, if she does not believe in personal feature of Krishna, the answer is yes. Okay. I mean, don't get me wrong. Those people 
who stopped person uh, um, um, effulgence, they're very pure. They're very pure. I mean, they're above the contamination of the material world. Remember, we were saying they've gotten over the three, three modes of material nature. Uh, they've gotten over the lamentations and hankerings. They've gotten over the concept of, you know, we're not this body. All those kind of, they've gotten over all that. So they're very pure. But they don't have complete understanding. That's the difference. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Sure. They're not ordinary people. But they don't know that this further they can go. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Sure, Hare Krishna Salimata. Yeah, I just had maybe a question or comment yeah. or yeah, reflection. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so it's, I, I mean, just understanding this Brahman the effulgence and the impersonalist, like it's so, I mean, I, I can't even imagine, like it's so hard to even reach that stage, Prabhu, of nulling the material nature coming about that, right? Without yes. Krishna, without Krishna or devotion service, like I don't even know how at least yogis are sitting and meditating, but this yeah. particular group, how do they even reach that level? Probably? Actually, what you just said is exactly what Lord Krishna says in chapter 12, text 5. Yes, these people go through so much hardship. It's so difficult. It's, there's nothing to hang on to. We can hang on to the lotus feet of Krishna and then they support. Where's their support? There's no support. Light cannot support you. Air cannot support you. Right? So you need something solid. You need an anchor. That's Krishna. They don't have that. So their life is very difficult. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why the failure rate is very high. Yeah, so your reflection is very good. Very good. Thank you, sir. Sure. Anybody else? Okay, then let's continue. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Like oh, one, sorry. one quick question. Yes, no, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so are these like oh, sorry, are these like three steps or like devotee uh, like crosses the uh, the Paramatma and the Brahman if we'll just uh, and uh, okay. Uh, I, I may not be putting it the I right understand. way. I think I understand. Okay. Okay. So it is not necessarily a linear process. You have to go through all these stages. You could, as I was saying before, you could, but you don't have to. Just remember uh, uh, chapter, what's the chapter? Chapter 7, text 16. It says, Chatur Vidha Bhajante Maam Jana Sukritano Arjuna Art Artharthi Jigyasu Gyani Jabar Arshaba. It must be very familiar uh, with that verse. So Krishna is saying that four types of people come to me. One is distressed. One is looking for economic development. One is inquisitive. And the other is knowledge, Gyani person. Right? <laughs> but for all those, one common characteristic is they are Sukritino. Sukritino means they have earned some devotional credit. Yeah. Devotional credit is earned by knowingly or unknowingly serving a devotee. And the example I can give you is, for example, um, unknowing service is you go to India and you plant a mango tree and you come back to Canada. And over the next five years, the tree grows. You're still in Toronto. Tree grows and starts to bear fruits, the mangoes, beautiful ST mangoes. One day, a devotee in the month of June, July, walking by, the sun is too hot, you know, he sits under the shadow of this tree, you know, gets rest under this tree, he looks up, he sees the ripe mangoes, he takes a few, eats them, and on his way. You have no idea something like that happened. But Krishna knows. Remember, Krishna is what? All cognizant. So he knows. You get the credit for those mangoes by which you served the devotee and the shade of the tree that he got, he rested. You got the credit. So you earn those credits. Sometimes you may serve a devotee knowingly. You know, invite them to, a, to your house for a prasadam or whatever. You know, massage his feet or help him in some way. You serve the devotee. You, you continue to accumulate devotional credits that way. And by doing that, one day you may, by Krishna's mercy or devotee's mercy, come to Krishna. And you may not have done any paramatma meditation or impersonalism or anything like that. Or, on the other hand, 
you could have been a karmi. A karmi, you become nishkam karmi. And beyond that, you become a, uh, a impersonalist. And then you go further, you become a yogi. And then somehow you become bhakti. So either way is possible. Okay. Okay, Prabhuji. Sure. Uh, so like, I mean, maybe a continuation of this same question. Um, <laughs> is it like a final goal for all the, uh, for all of us or like any of us, I mean, all of us um, is to reach, I mean, no, uh, not the goal, but uh, is the destination always Krishna? I mean, like we may go through uh, or, or any of these uh, Brahmanifalges or the Paramatma state, but then is it mandatory or like is it um, natural to go to Krishna at the end? I mean, like, I mean, not at the end, but um, is it mandatory? Well, mandatory means that something will go wrong if you don't do it, right? Is that what mandatory means? Mm. What does mandatory mean in your in your question? Uh, no. What does mandatory mean? Is it is it a rule? Well, okay. So let let me not use your words. Let me use my words, and then you tell me if that's the correct answer. So first of all, we came here by our own sweet will. That's the use of free will, misuse, you can say, free will. That's how we ended up. We wanted to be the master, we wanted to be the controller, we wanted to be the enjoyer, so we ended up here. We can go back to him only if we want to. If we don't want to, Krishna will not force us, and therefore it's not mandatory in that sense. Does Krishna want us back? The answer is yes. If that makes it mandatory, well, that's why I'm asking you what your definition is. But nobody's going to force you to go back to Krishna. Not even Krishna will force you. You'll have to decide one day. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, you're entangled in the cycle of birth and death, in the material world, going up and down 8.4 million different species, sometimes material misery, sometimes material happiness. And it's like uh, Bhakti Thakur says, it's like a bubble going up and down in the water. And that's all we're doing. Okay. But again, so so the point here is uh, only if we want to go and Krishna uh, and with Krishna's mercy we can go or it is it can be only with Krishna's mercy. Yeah, that's called Ahatuki Kripa causes mercy. That can happen. But the scriptures warn us don't sit and wait for it. It's very rare. Okay. 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 So, so now, now the um, uh, takeaway could be now that we know this is what we can do. I think we should do. So, so you say again, bro. I mean, like, I mean, now that we are, we are in the path of uh, learning this, knowing this, how it works. I think the only way is to. Um, work towards that. Work yes, towards absolutely. We should realize how rare the human birth is. We should realize how long we've been rotting in this material world. We should realize that there's nothing but misery in the material world. We should realize that we are actually like fish out of water, suffering like anything. And there's no cure except to go back. So when we become completely tired of the miseries, when you get completely frustrated by our inability to do anything about it, when you get an understanding that only way out is, is uh, mercy of Krishna or his devotees, then maybe we'll come to our senses and uh, take shelter of Krishna. Bhajahu remana, shinanda nandana, abhaya charnara vindare, dullava manus janam, sat sange, tarahu ebhav sundare. Says here, Govinda is saying that we, the only way is to take shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna and associate with the devotees if we want to ever get out of the material world. There's no other way. 
and we have to do that. Okay. But okay. again, it has to come from us. Krishna is not going to force you. Yeah. He'll put you in different circumstances, but ultimately you have to decide. Yeah. At least this is definitely the uh, start or knowing. I mean, see, knowing that it is, is the first step, I think, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Okay. Uh, I just got a note saying that uh, it's too much for one day and maybe I should stop, allow you to digest. Hmm. Maybe I'll send the recording out and maybe you can listen to it. And then next week you can tell me how much went into the brain and how much did not that needs to be repeated. And I can do that. In the meantime, we still have a few more minutes that you have any questions, any reflections, realizations, or comments that you want to make, we can do that. I'm going to put the gallery view so I can see everybody. Next Thank week is 55. I'm sorry, Matari? Next week, 55. Yes. No, what well, depends. We have not finished this section. We're not finished yet. Okay. Maybe I'm... Did I, did I make it too complicated? I mean, just give me a frank uh, opinion. Was it too much information? Like, you would rather not hear all this? And no, probably it's no, no problem. problem. No problem. No Not at all. No problem. Okay. Very nice. Because it can be confusing. I know that. Probably we got what was explained, but no it more. Totally I said to learn more. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It is removing the confusion. I'm sorry? It is removing the confusion. Not putting in confusion, removing the confusion. Did you did you get me, Prabhuji? No, I didn't. It's, it is removing our confusion. I don't know what that means. Removing after? No, no, Prabhuji. Like, confused. confused. We are not confused. Oh, you're not confused. Okay. Because we have it's cleared out. Oh, great. Okay. I also want to thank Prabhuji for his question and really good answer because eventually that's what the realization is. Well, what uh, to know and then uh, after knowing try to internalize correct correct actually Prabhu thank you for pointing that out emphatically because anything we read from the scriptures or discuss about the scriptures if we don't meditate upon how are we going to apply this to our life it's really not much use we're basically getting 5% of it Get 100%. You have to think about how does it apply to me? How can I apply this in my life? You know, what lessons there that I can learn and internalize and live it? If you're not living it, then what's the use? So, yeah, that's very, very important. Too. Very important. And that's the only way we can make progress. And that's why I always encourage you not clear, ask me 100 times. Let me explain. If you don't understand, that's my weakness, that I did not explain well. So don't be embarrassed. I say, you're lousy, you don't know how to explain it, and I'll try again. <laughs> so it's still lousy. Well, I'll explain again. I'll try and try and try and until you say, okay, enough. I'm either tired or okay, I got it. So don't be shy. Try being so a Canadian nice. student, not Indian student. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Actually, Prabhuji, I could uh, relate uh, this to uh, the seven uh, stages of yoga that I read last year, like Nishkam, Karma Yoga, Karma Yoga, and then Ashtang Karma Yoga, and then finally, like Bhakti Yoga, the seventh stage. The yoga ladder. So, yes, the ladder. So, it was explained that if you uh, step by step go to this ladder, it's very difficult what you yeah. were trying mm -hmm. to explain. So being uh, like, if we uh, if we are devotees like uh, and practice bhakti yoga, so that is the simplest way of uh, like uh, going back to Krishna. Correct. This, this Krishna calls it the easiest and the most direct. Yes, yes. Coming to him. And actually, there is a verse in Shivad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, chapter 33, text 7. Actually, it's Mother Devhuti saying, 
She says that for those lucky people who are chanting your name, they have already done all the austerities, they've already read all the scriptures, all the prerequisites, they've already done that. The, you know, like charity and all those kind of things. And then and then only they're able to chant your name. So the fact that we are chanting Krishna's name means we have already been through all those stages. Don't have to worry about it. We may not remember it, but we have done it. Otherwise, we will not be chanting Krishna's name. So feel good about that. Yes, Prabhuji. But at the same time, all that we are doing is chanting, but other things <clears throat> which we seem to have done, uh, at this stage, even to take up a little fraction of that seems very challenging and next to impossible. Well, so, you know, I mean, <laughs> we can look at it this way. Remember the story of that Brahmin who was totally illiterate. When he was sitting in the Srirangam temple and reading the book with everybody standing around him laughing at him because he could not pronounce words. He didn't know how to read. And what happened? Lord Chaitanya came and embraced him. Isn't that the ultimate goal of reading Bhagavad Gita? He got the ultimate goal, even despite the fact he can't read. He couldn't pronounce a single word. So what is more important? Is it the scholastic part of it? Or is it the sentiments? Is the faith? Is the devotion? Is the feeling in the heart? What's more important? So therefore, don't worry that you cannot memorize the 700 verses of Bhagavad Gita and 18,000 verses of Bhagavatam and whatever else. That's not what Krishna is looking for. Krishna is looking for what feeling do you have in your heart? How clean is your heart? Will he feel like he can do vishram in your heart? Tomar Hedaya Sada Govinda Vishram. Nautam Dasaku says to Vaishnava, Krishna is always resting in your heart. Because there's no agitation in the heart. So he can rest. Not every 30 seconds somebody is coming, shaking them up and saying, I want this. There's no rest there. But in the devotee's heart, there's no material desire. He can rest. So that's our goal. It's not to understand the script. The only reason we want to understand the scriptures is so we can understand what our goal is. We can become inspired by the stories of the devotees. And that's why this, everything we're reading, there's some reference to some devotee somewhere. Right? Just to inspire us that this is what we're inspiring for. Entry cases, don't worry about it. If you can't remember you know, whether Narayan expanded from Balaram or whether Vidyumna was before Aniruddha, what irrelevant, irrelevant. It doesn't matter. What's more important is that they are the supreme personalities of Godhead and we are there to serve them. If you don't understand that, what's the use of all the details? And when I say understand, I mean implement in your life. That's what it's about. And that's what we should be striving for. Are we actually serving Krishna from the heart. You all know many devotees in different temples, very senior, they can rhyme off the verses, but they can't behave at all. You can see there's no love in their heart for the Lord. Everything is show off. I'm a great singer, but I won't sing unless there's at least 200 people in the temple. And I got my preferred Nidanga player and I got my preferred Katal player, so on and so forth. Otherwise I won't sing. That's not. That's not love for Krishna. So my point is, let's ask ourselves, how much love do we feel in our heart for Krishna? What are we willing to do for Krishna? Gopis were willing to give up everything. We're not at that level. But what is it that we are willing to give up? Rupad was, um, he had a disciple by the name of Sham Sundar, very famous disciple, Sham Sundar. He was a carpenter also. The first large deities of Lord Jagannath Baladev Subhadra, he was given the responsibility to carve. And he was doing that. One day, Rupad walked into the room where he was carving these deities and he saw, get this, he saw a packet of cigarette on top of the head of Jagannath. And you know what Rupad said? 
these small things will keep us in the material world. And that's our problem. We got many small issues with us that could keep us in this material world forever. So let's worry about those small things. Let's not worry about the big things like how many verses do I know? How well can I speak? How well can I sing? You know, who's admiring me? Irrelevant. And that's where the effort should be. Purification of the heart. Development of sentiments for Krishna. So we read these scriptures, read the stories of the devotees for that reason. So Bhagavatam is full of stories of devotees. Why? More about devotees than about Krishna. Why? Because that's what inspires, that's what teaches us how to act, how to have that faith, how to make the sacrifice, how to give up everything for Krishna. How is Krishna and nothing else for us? How much Radharani, how much Sakhis loved Krishna? What Shadamiya will not do for Krishna? So on and so forth. That's what we need to inspire us to develop that love, to develop that feeling in our heart for Krishna. Otherwise, all useless, totally useless. Okay. Is it getting too heavy? I'll stop. It's about time. Hmm? It, it's about time. About time to stop? Oh. Hare Krishna, Prabhu, <laughs> I have a question. Ah, Usha. Prabhu, huh? uh, Abhi, we said that you said that everybody wants to go to Krishna. We want to go to Krishna. Well, not but everybody wants to go to Krishna. Krishna. Let's say I want yeah. to go to Krishna. Okay, let's say you got it. I know but, you. Uh, <laughs> So what Krishna doesn't want me to come to him. No, that's not true. How do I? And he glad. wants me to come to him. Ah, okay, so I'm, I'm going to interrupt and say, no, Krishna wants all of us to be back to him. Krishna works very hard to get us back to him. Krishna is very sad and he actually cries when he sees us suffer. Because remember, we are his children. So let's talk about what does Krishna do to encourage us to go to him. Can you give me some examples? He gave the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so that's one. Know everything and okay. Yeah. What else? What else does he do? Prabhu, he has also made a simple. He has given us many ways to serve him, like you know, cooking. He has okay, made. Sure. So he's yeah. given him many ways to serve. What else does he do? He, what does he, he do himself? Provide, provide all the facility. We can go to him. We can worship him. Okay, but you all. He has given us our acharyas, Prabhu. Okay. He will respond by hundred times. Sorry, Prabhu? Rajan Prabhu? Oh, he gave so, us the Maha Mantra. Okay. Maha okay, Rajan Prabhu, you're saying? Yeah, so he will respond 100,000 times to our effort. So if we take one step, he's going to kill. Okay. Take okay. Yeah. Krishna takes avatars so that. So he takes many incarnations, yes. Right. Comes down from Golok Vandavan, all the comfort, this material, miserable world for us. What else does he do? Who is standing there 24 7? You got it. Standing there 24 7 places where nobody goes. Just waiting for you to come. Yep. Just waiting for you to come. And we are saying, no, I don't want to go. <laughs> you know, somebody sees the. Where is he waiting? Sorry, Usha? Where is he waiting for us? Where? Everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. <laughs> um, I mean, he even, he even waited inside the pillar. Yep. <laughs> He's too yep. clear. He didn't yeah, come from somewhere. He was standing there. He didn't That's travel true. from somewhere. He was there. He stands there in the rain, sunshine, and heat and cold. You yeah. know, and nobody's feeding him, but he's standing there just in case somebody comes. He comes as somebody says, Acharyas, as scriptures, as all these incarnations, the deity form, all those things he's doing for us. Somehow the please come to me. I'm miserable because you're miserable. That's father's love. That's Krishna's love. Prabhuji, I I have uh, like heard a very good example for it uh, from my Acharya ji. Uh, so he said like, 
it's a kind of father and children like father son yeah. relationship yeah. and sometimes when children they grow up at a teenage they are influenced by so many things what we call maya in this material nature so they just uh, forget everything that our parent is waiting back at our home but father he always wants his children to come back to him and he always call us back so but it is uh, like we who have forgotten things so the first thing is like we uh, to have that self realization and uh, to understand that who we are and establish our relationship with like krishna that he is the father and yeah. we need to go back to our home yeah i and sometimes we don't see the sacrifices krishna is making for us yes you know we we should uh, tonight let's all go home and well we are already home but let's let's all go after this call and meditate upon what is krishna doing for us individually what difficulty is facing what trouble he's taking you know what inconvenience he's taking yes, so we'll be attracted to him you know and sometimes we find that we learn better when our parent is teaching something or the Krishna's teaching, we just, eh. Okay. Yes. All right. Anything else? It's 9.38. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to stop recording. Uh,